Good morning, everyone, again. I'm excited to see the chairs full and uh, eager hearts and faces ready for some enlightenment from the message that comes directly from God. I've entitled this morning's message, Minimum Daily Requirements. You've heard that term before. Somebody just called it MDRs, but the things that we need every day as a minimum to survive, and it comes to us from a foundation of the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, the 10 through, uh, verse 10 through 20. This epistle focuses upon the protective armaments that shield and strengthen every believer. How does that sound to you? If you're a believer, God gives you something to protect you, to shield you from the outside, from the evil around us. You see, the community draws its vitality from the health of each soul that is present. So your presence is ultimately important to the kingdom. The apostle used things of military armament because that's something that they could understand in their day and in their time. Maybe it would be that if we take this message and share it with someone else in our time, we could use a different illustration that would be more easily understood, but in Paul's time to talk about military protection, those people knew about armor. And they could feel and, and pull strength and power from an illustration of the whole armor of God. See what I mean when I share with you the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. The sixth chapter, verses 10 through 20. Be strong in the Lord and mighty in his power.
Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. The words of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. It was the first month in seminary. We were all nervous. We were all anxious. We were trying to take in every bit of wisdom, of truth that we could that we could find in every lecture from every professor. It was kind of like sitting at the feet of theologians of all times. It was one of those introduction to New Testament classes. You might relate to it as an auditorium style class where hundreds of nervous students come through the door like a cattle call heading towards the feeding trough. When we sat in our little chairs, we were very silent. We were writing almost every word that came out of the mouth of the professor, hoping not to miss a single thing. And then came the question, right in the middle of his lecture. You know the question. That question. Is there anyone in this room who does not believe that Satan exists? That there is evil in this world? Raise your hand. Well, we were already so nervous we couldn't even understand what he was saying because we were ready for a lecture, not a question. And we were afraid that if we answered, he'd call on us. Maybe give a testimony. Maybe explain what it is we were trying. What did he say? Raise your hand if you believe that there's a evil. Or did he say, raise your hand if you say that you don't believe that evil in the world. Whether we got the question right or not, several people raised their hands very timidly. And the one that raised their hand first, the professor pointed at him. And he said, Gather your stuff, get out of my classroom, get your money back before you pass the time for refunds. You don't belong in seminary. The world of evil will throw everything it has in hell to capture you, control you, devour you. You don't belong in seminary. And if you still believe that there is no evil in this world, it's time to get out. I don't have to tell you, not a single student stood up. He went back to his lecture and started teaching the basics of the New Testament. And that's how seminary started. With the wise and the unwise, the nervous and the confident, the learned and the wanting to learn. Because we knew we needed the tools, the armament, to face the constant attacks from the world, especially if we were going to be ordained in ministry. Because there are dark powers in our world. And it's not some comic book fantasy. It's not some, some uh, computer app. And by the way, some of those are very scary. And what they do wrong is not by being played and not by being present and not by luring us in. It is by desensitizing us to the ability to determine the good and the bad. And that's how evil works. Break down the armor so that you're vulnerable to making decisions that don't matter. See, my sisters and brothers, love is not always pink and fluffy. That's why the apostle tells us that God provides for us not a bunny rabbit, but the armor of God. And it shields you like the, 
An M&M. Well, an M&M that does not dissolve. Jesus said to Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. That's powerful. That's protection. That's promise. So you see, as children of God, as the faithful, we are called to be a community of constant prayer. What does that mean? It means that God is counting on you. Counting on you to be in prayer in response to everything. Until prayer becomes your common response to everything. That when you pray to God, it's not a second thought. It's not even a thought. It's a response. That you and God become like this. And you tackle the world together. Last week we were talking also about Ephesians. And we focused on spiritual concerns for those of faith. And as a community of them, worship and praise are the mainstay of who we are as, as God's children. This week, Paul goes one extra step to give you the confidence that you can carry out the promise that God made and the protection that God places around you and for you. And it happens for every single believer. You get that as a bonus package. You don't pay extra. It's there to protect you. Because Paul wrote it as the armor of God, we get it. Because we see this vision of what it looks like. And to me, the armor of God always looked like the Middle Age, Ages Crusaders. With all of that heavy steel around them. To deflect the arrows. To withstand the shock of the swords. All of those things, the world comes after us. And trust me, even today, those things that come after us are as powerful as flaming arrows and sharpened swords. For years in our generation, and I'm sure in all of your generations, we've been force-fed what it means to have the minimum daily requirements. And when we do that, we're really talking about diet, aren't we? We're talking about things like the meats, the dairies, the fruits, the vegetables. And don't forget those of you that love carbs. The, the breads. You know, my notes don't say anything about desserts, but that has to be a part of the four groups. But our whole society is based on what makes us healthy. What can we do to lose this, gain this, and be stronger and live longer? We're now informed that we no longer need all of the meat. Or you don't even need all of the milk. Fat is out, fiber's in. Carbohydrates climb in their place on the chart. Proteins plummet. Even if we're no longer sure what exactly we mean when we say the minimum daily requirements, we do know that we need some specific things to remain healthy. And that's this, the body. We hardly ever discuss in public what it means to be spiritually ready. If the, um, the basic everyday minimum requirements to keep our bodies healthy, there must be a sign that says what do we need as a minimum to keep our spiritual body healthy fit and ready to go. It needs a balanced diet of prayer and praise and worship and the actual work of the kingdom. We talked about it in the, in the children's time about the, 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 the feet that go out to do the work of the kingdom. We need all of those things to prepare our bodies to be ready to do the work of the kingdom in a world that is in war against the promises God made. So in our faith journeys, we do need those one-a-day things 
that make our spiritual body as healthy as our physical body. The first minimum daily requirement for the spiritual body is for us to be found in groups. Religion, Christianity, God's children are, are not a single act. They're kind of like grapes. We're to grow in clusters. Our participation in the community of faith is not an elective. We even talked this morning about that in the learning hour, about people who say, I don't have to go to church. I can find God in nature. I have some of those people in my family. And they say the, the beauty of the creation of God is all I need. But you see, that's not true. Because when the world attacks that person who says, I'm busy enjoying the beauty of the world, they're breaking that heart apart. There's a regime that we have just for spiritual buildup. And it comes in forms of devotion and prayer breakfast and study circles and Bible studies. You see, we need each other to practice on, to share our love with, to keep our faith and remind each of us the promise of hope. You see, that's the reward of the spiritual healthy body. Just as muscles and long life are the rewards of, of a good physical body, these things prepare us for a strong and effective spiritual body. Now the second requirement is that we have to flex our muscles every day to keep feet, to keep fit. So the question comes to you that you don't have to answer because I know your answer is going to be yes. Do, do you take time every day for a devotion? Do you read your Bible every day? Do you sing even if you're in the shower or driving in the car by yourself? Because God loves to hear the joy in your heart from your communication and your association. It's that personal con contact thing with God. And those in my family who believe that God is in nature, and God is in nature, that that's all they need, I don't believe they sing ever in their car or in the shower. Now the third thing is about mission. Because if we have nothing else that, that we focus upon in becoming physically and spiritually strong, is you have to have a focus of what to do with a strong body and a, and a strong spiritual uh, self. Because no matter how busy your life is, if you're not in mission for the kingdom, it's without worth. Because it's what it means to be a Christian, is to be in mission, to reach out, to touch other people's lives, to, to help them understand who God is to you and who God can be to them. It is the works of faith in our world, and it turns our world into a world of, of faith. She's with the kids, right? <coughs> I'm never going to admit this in public. With her there. <laughs> Candy always says that the message is never for you. God always puts the message on my heart because it's for me. And so the, uh, the fourth spiritual daily requirement is to figure out some downtime. Take some time for yourself. Take some time to relax, to get away from the, the woes of the world, to rest, to regroup. It's important as you are developing your spiritual health. On the airplane, you've heard this before, the stewardess says, if something happens, you're going to have the uh, oxygen mask drop down out of the ceiling. And, and if you're with a friend or a child that needs help, put yours on first. Because you can't help them if you're not alive to do that. Take some God time. Be silent. Read. Meditate. Walk quietly in the world with your eyes and heart open. 
because you have to be equipped for the mission that God has placed you on. Finally, there's the fifth spiritual daily requirement. It is our spiritual strength. And you have to understand that that is not based on your own ability, your own understanding of who God is, your own understanding and practice of prayer and devotion. It is about God in you fulfilling that need for understanding because you don't come equipped with that wisdom. It's something that in your interaction with God, you develop, you receive another gift of, of the Spirit. You need a little dose of the Bible. It's what helps grow your spiritual health. And you know the worst part of all of this, again, preaching to self, not to you, is that reading your Bible, daily prayer, all those things we've talked about to build your spiritual, your spiritual self seem to be the easiest things to put on your calendar for tomorrow. You should see my calendar. Packed full of things that I should do tomorrow. Sometimes we think that it's for the kids. We send them out. We teach them. They're growing. Isn't that great? I used to be a kid. I used to get all that stuff now. But for me, then they're done that. It's optional for adults. It's not optional for adult sisters and brothers. It's the most vital part of your spiritual health. The world is filled with spiritual warfare. And if we are going to be the, the people that God is counting on, we, we sometimes call ourselves the God Squad, don't we? If, if we're going to be the God Squad that God is, is planning on, counting on, we need to be prepared. We need to be ready so that it doesn't take us down when we're in the routine of our daily lives. So I have a couple of stories. Maybe these will mean more than all the words I've said. So at the end of the service, the, the preacher always stands at the door, right? Wants to shake the hands of everybody that came and greet them, wish them well, hope you have a good week. Sometimes they say, oh, that was a great message. If you haven't said that to your pastor lately, do that sometimes. <laughs> whether, you, whether you mean it or not, it, it does so much good. And so he's standing there greeting people and here comes a, a face that he hasn't seen in a long time. And he says, he grabs his hand and he says, pulls him over to the side like this. And he says, I'm so glad you're here. I, I haven't seen you in such a long time. And the guy responds, well, you know, I, I do come. He says, yeah, but Christmas and Easter is just not enough. He says, oh, contraire. He says, I am on the God Squad. But we call it the Secret Service. Okay. Let me try one more. A woman has this dream. And she goes into this new shop in town. And she walks in to see what it is. It looks fabulous from the outside. She walks in. And you won't believe it. God is standing at the counter to check out. And she's looking around and she looks at God and God says, uh, good morning. I'm glad you're here. And the woman's stunned. She's trying to find something that she can say to God who obviously is the shop owner. What do you sell here? And God responds, anything and everything your heart desires. She's trying to regroup, right? She's trying to think of something very intellectual to say. And so she says to God, I want peace of mind, love and happiness, and wisdom, and freedom from fear. And she thinks a minute, she says, oh, this has got to be a little bit better than that. For everyone, not just for me, for everyone in the world. 
And God smiled and he said, uh, I think you've got me wrong, dear. We don't sell fruits and vegetables. We just sell seeds. <laughs> <laughs> the apostles' message to the Ephesians was to prepare them to do the work, the good, the mission in their world. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking two and a half millennium ago or today, the message is still the same. The message is here to prepare you for what's outside. And to do that, you're going to need some spiritual protection. And think twice about this. And you're going to need the courage to wear it out. And all the children said, Thank you.